This 12 volt DC gear motor has a huge part of the story of how I got here today. The first product that I ever brought to market used this 12 volt DC gear motor. Its output shaft is turning at quite a few thousand RPMs. I wanted something that was turning at about 60 RPMs. So there's a stack of planetary gearboxes in here that give us that lower RPM and higher torque output shaft. And ever since then, I've been obsessed with ways of getting more torque and lower speed out of motors because so often that seems like the way we want to use them. And then I stumbled across hypocycloid gears. This is the most mesmerizing action and it has a really cool benefit of being a compact single stage way of having a huge gear reduction value. So we can take a really high RPM motor, reduce those RPMs and increase the torque. These hypocycloid gears are similar to a harmonic drive, but harmonic drives, as cool as they are, are also not practical to make on our own. Hypocycloid gears are definitely something we can make on the machine, so let's have some fun. Let's take a closer look at some of these gear train systems. So that motor I mentioned from the rifle target was a planetary gearbox. It uses multiple stages of this sort of a reduction. And to me, it's really a mesmerizing mechanism, but many of the planetary gearboxes that we've seen still only have a fraction of the gear reduction in a single stage. So in the case of that strike mark motor, we needed three stages to get the RPMs down. The hypocycloid gears work in a totally different manner. And here, the green shaft is our higher RPM input shaft and it's driving the gold colored platter on the eccentric location on that bearing. And as that cycloidal disc is rotating, it's meshing with those teeth or those hemispherical objects you see here and driving the purple output disc at a significantly reduced gear ratio. In the example that we're making, it is 169 to one. The first Fusion model that we built here, we'll share this on the NYC CNC page card here for the folks here that wanna be building robots or higher torque output mechanisms with this sort of a design is again, just awesome to look at. You can rotate this knob and watch as the eccentric shaft rotates around and interfaces with the red output shaft here. And you can start to get a feel of just what that reduction looks like. You can slowly watch that red output shaft rotate as I'm turning this knob. And now anytime you build something like this, of course, the first thing you gotta do is, is see what can we really do with it. So fully expecting it not to survive this, partly because we were just using a laser cut acrylic housing. We put it on the Tormach 770, turned it up to 10,000 RPMs, and it worked. Now this does start to highlight some of the potential risks or problems of a hypocycloid drive, which is that there can be balance issues. Uh, they're also not as good as a harmonic drive, from what I understand, because a harmonic drive has the ability to flex this inner sleeve that can engage uh, two teeth simultaneously, 180 degrees opposite to each other, which can fully eliminate backlash. There can still be some backlash from angular deflection in a hypocycloid drive system. From a practical standpoint, it's still minimal and definitely not back drivable. Starting off holding a piece of raw material in a three jaw chuck, there's really no better way to hold round parts on a mill. Now this is not the way you machine parts if you're trying to hold tenths, but this is a part that came off of a bandsaw. So establishing that Z datum underneath the part isn't critical beyond a couple of thousandths of an inch. And sometimes if you don't have an object like a parallel, there isn't a clear solid mating surface to use your Heimer to come down and set your Z height before you put your part in. So here Alex is using a gauge block and holding it up such that the top of the gauge block becomes coplanar with that saw cut surface jogging the Heimer down. It's a little bit of an art form, but, but with the touchscreen on PathPilot, I think it makes it pretty easy to do this. And you can actually double check your measurement by letting that gauge block down, relaxing the Heimer, bringing it back up. And again, plenty accurate for the task at hand. Spot, drill, and while we've got that drill out, poke a hole through the middle because that makes it all that much easier to come in with our quarter inch end mill and do the first adaptive to rough out the majority of that material before coming back later with a 1 8 inch end mill to do a rest machining adaptive that lets us get into the areas too small for the quarter inch end mill to reach. Finally, some cleanups and chamfers and then moving this part over to the fixture. And this whole project was 
Alex, if you remember Alex from some past videos, kind of his capstone project of his time here at Saunders Machine Works. And really, really proud of what Alex did. I think he's a great role model for other folks that are interested in learning about getting into the trades, whether it's engineering or machining or computer science. He's really done a great job at his high school on a robotics team. He was taking college classes while in high school at a local program called Pathways to Engineering, and he's now off pursuing his four-year degree. We definitely miss him, but I know Alex is going to be better at what he does in life because he's had the chance to go through speeds and feeds, to go through setting up a machine tool, to go through making parts, and in this case, building a pretty cool fixture. What Alex did here was built a single fixture that has two sides, which I give him so much credit for. The left side here, we've got a traditional pit bull talon setup. Not traditionally the best setup for round parts, but you can see the machined features on the left and the right help avoid any left to right shift on that, which ensures as we're biting in with the pit bull and the talon, which they do quite well, we should have a good recipe for holding on. And this same fixture allows him to flip the part over and clock it on this side. And if you flip the fixture over, He's got the ways to pull the part both externally as well as internally to have full access to the parts. And if there's one thing I love about machining, I will never grow tired of seeing how other people tackle fixturing and work holding. Next up, machining the output shaft. Our version of this hypocycloid is slightly different than the video footage we showed off of Wikipedia, but it's the same general principle. As we drive the input of the hypocycloid gear, the top layer of teeth are meshing with, in this case, the demo acrylic housing. And this monolithic piece, shown in kind of a bluish purple here, then causes the bottom layer to mesh with the posts on the red output piece. As you can see, as I rotate that ever so slightly, you're seeing the motion in that output shaft. And that's what's so cool is it's such a high gear ratio that it's, it's hard to see at first. And it's again, what makes this to me so mesmerizing. The version that we're making here on this video is actually a multi-stage reduction. It was a project that was inspired by this idea of looking at something over an incredibly long period of time. So having these multiple stages means an almost incomprehensible output. So with an input motor speed of 1500 RPMs, in a time frame of approximately 30 years, the output shaft will only move about 60 degrees or one sixth of a rotation. So time out. Who here hates seeing the Fusion 360 adaptive cam toolpath lift all the way up, move over, and go back down? It's one of the most common things I hear from folks as a complaint or something they don't like. So let's talk about that for a second. Take a look at this adaptive. Every yellow toolpath that we see here is a linking move or a zebra tracked lift move. I'm going to right click, duplicate. I'll rename this to Fewer Z Retracts. And the fix for this is under the linking tab, stay down level, change it from least to most. I do like to keep a lift height of five thousandths of an inch that will still lift the tool off your part so it's not dragging it across, especially as your machine accelerates or decelerates. You will see that manifest itself in the part, even on the world's most perfect high-end machining center because of the physics of how a machine moves. So we do want it to lift up 
you can see we've gone from quite a few linking moves to very few. So why is fewer Z not the default? Well, a couple reasons. Number one, Z moves on vertical machining centers tend to be pretty quick. So it may not cost as much in the sense of time or productivity. The other reason is the compute time. Lifting up to a retract plane gives the tool the freedom to go wherever it wants at a really fast feed rate, and Fusion doesn't have to think about it. Again, as soon as it's up to the retract plane, it just goes to the XY position at once. With stay down the most, you can't go as fast. We've got the feed rate set to 90 inches a minute, but more importantly, Fusion has to go analyze that model and decide how can I get from point A to point B without crashing into the solid model. So the additional compute time on a simple part like this was negligible, but on more complex parts or longer operations, you will see the stay down level directly affect how long it takes Fusion to compute the toolpath. Another bonus pro tip, who here saw the new toolpath visibility feature that just came into the most recent Fusion update? By default, in Fusion, we see things like this red arrow, which just shows the start of the toolpath as it comes down, this yellow linking move, this green lead in move, and then blue is when it's actually cutting or in the cut. But if you notice, we've got this new icon down here and we can turn off the leads and the linking. And this can be really nice because sometimes all I wanna see is the cut path. I don't always wanna have the noise or the visual distraction of the other move. So shout out to Autodesk for adding that in. As much as I wanted to edit that footage out, I think it's a teaching moment to leave in there. I do not encourage or recommend using a hammer with a combination pit bull talon grip style or really any talon grip style clamp. As the pit bull clamp pushes that part into the talon grip, there's a natural angle that can, should, and will pull that part down. So using a hammer should not improve the gripping position and performance of that clamp and in fact can hurt it by causing the bite mark or the grip to slightly enlarge in itself or shock the clamp and shorten its long-term life.
All right, folks, pause here. What do you think is about to happen? Sometimes you can get away with this, but a lot of times you can't, especially on less forgiving materials like steels and especially things like titanium. A number of different specific things can happen, all of which tend to result in catastrophic failure. Number one is that strip of aluminum will block chip evacuation, causing the chips to stay in the flutes and it will either pack the flutes in or cause them to heat up, both of which will result in almost immediate tool failure. The second thing is you'll start to recut either other chips or that piece of flap, and that will cause a huge increase in the chip load per tooth. You're asking the tool to cut more. That can also break it. And third, you're likely going to induce some amount of chatter or vibration, even if you can't hear it, but carbide doesn't like that. If this happens, it's usually because you mismeasured a part, mismeasured a tool, or for me, the most likely sin I commit on this is I haven't paid attention to my top heights. It can be really important to run tools lower than the plane you're trying to, if and when that's acceptable to do so, and watch out if your tool has a five or 10 thou corner radius. I love corner rads to strengthen end mills, but depending on how you're using those tools, they can also lead to some of this extra material hanging around. There she is. This whole project was inspired by Arthur Ganson's Machine with Concrete. I don't remember whether I saw this in person or I just saw a video of it years ago, but it always stuck in my mind. It's just this beautiful device that has this kind of artistic whimsy play where the input shaft, I believe, is a couple of hundred RPMs, and it takes something like a trillion years to complete a revolution, which is a good thing because the output shaft is actually cast into this block of concrete. So our project is a modern play on that. We've got our Arduino in here with the Sabertooth motor driver. We'll throw up all the Arduino code on the NYC CNC website. Alex put an encoder on here so we can actually have tracking of the RPM with feedback. We're using the hypocycloidal drives instead of worm gears. And I thought it would be fun to have a hatchet output that will break a toothpick after 50 years. And we're off. And I love this project because it's everything that I wanted to know and learn 10 years ago when we were trying to bring our StrikeMark product to market. How do you work with acrylic or sheet metal or Arduino or prototyping or motors and sensors and machined parts? And the world that we live in today is so much better. I hope we're a good resource for the folks out there that are trying to do this, whether it's through this YouTube channel. We've got content on manufacturing and entrepreneurship over at NYC cnc.com we've got cnc training classes and our new project proven cut helps you out as a speeds and feeds video library it's also just a great time to be alive with all of the resources and information out there as always folks take care see you soon